Hi everyone, it's Michelle and welcome back to the Royal Daily Tea History and Fashion Channel. What happens when a romance goes bad? What happens when a fairy tale turns into a living nightmare? What happens when your ex-lover becomes unhinged and stalks and harasses you for a decade? And what happens if your ex-lover happens to be the exiled king of Spain? Today we are launching a brand new series called Karina and the King. This is the story of Karina Zuzan Wittgenstein, the former mistress of the now exiled king of Spain, King Juan Carlos I. This story has all the trappings of a thriller best-selling novel but in fact is a true story and today we are launching a series telling Karina's side of the story. Now this is in collaboration with Karina's new podcast, Karina and the King. The producers of that podcast did reach out to me and asked me if I would cover the podcast on my channel. If you're interested in listening to the podcast, I will have it linked for you down below. But I'm going to do a series of videos going over the complete story from beginning to current day of Karina and the king. And when I say truth is stranger than fiction, I'm not joking. We have romance, passion, corruption, intrigue, and a mysterious gift of 65 million euros that led to the downfall and the abdication of the king of Spain. But we're focusing on Karina as this is her story. So you know what to do. Sit back and relax. Grab yourself a beverage and let's get into the Royal Daily Tea. Today we're embarking on the very first episode of Karina and the King. So like any story, any fairy tale, it is always important to start at the very beginning and to learn about the key players in the story. So Karina Larson was born on January 28th, 1985 in Frankfurt, Germany to a pair of Danish parents. Now her father was a European director of Varig, the national airline of Brazil from 1961 to 1991. So Karina, as a child, grew up and traveled all over the world, from Frankfurt, Rio de Janeiro, Switzerland, and graduating from college in 1987 from the University of Genova. She is a well-traveled, well-cultured woman who also speaks multiple languages from English, French, Danish, Russian, Arabic, Spanish, and German. So she is able to travel in the highest echelons of society and fit right in. With her background of travel and culture, she credits her father for her upbringing where she was able to attend board meetings with her father where she would see high-powered executives negotiating. So she learned the art of deal-making, of negotiating with high-powered executives from all over the world, coupled with her traveling, with her ability to pick up and speak multiple languages, as well as her talent for being an expert skier and skater. It's very important to have a talent or a skill when you're hanging out with the highest echelons of society from royalty to government to the one percenters and the fact that she was a beautiful tall blonde didn't hurt and spoke multiple languages, had a talent for business and negotiation and could ski. So she was definitely someone who was not intimidated hanging around with the movers and the shakers of high society. Now in 1989, Karina met her first husband, Philip Adkins, a British businessman. By 1990, they were married and they had their daughter, Anastasia, in 1992. Unfortunately, their marriage did not last. So by October of 2000, Karina had married her second husband, Casimir Prince Zuzan Wittgenstein Zahn, 
who just happened to be 12 years younger and a German prince. By 2002, she had given birth to their son, Prince Alexander. And once again, unfortunately, her marriage by 2005 was over and they were divorced. Karina always felt that she was a little bit intimidating for the fact that she was very much a free thinker. She was not very submissive. She was very comfortable for telling people whether you were royalty or an executive her opinion and what she thought. Because of her upbringing, her being well-bred, well-traveled, well-cultured, she was a woman who had an opinion, and she was what she called quietly competitive. Now, she would sit in the background of any room. She would you know, watch people get her opinion. But if someone asked her opinion, she was free to give it. She was not a submissive woman. She was very intelligent. She was very successful. And she felt that this ultimately could have been the downfall of her previous marriage that men were very intimidated by her. Now, she was a very successful entrepreneur and businesswoman in her own right. From 2000 to 2006, she worked for Boss Sporting in public relations, which is a subsidiary of the gun-making firm Boss & Co. Now, she tells a story of how she developed a passion for shooting and for guns, how it's very mathematical, almost like a meditation, how you have to concentrate on shooting and the trajectory of the bullet. It's very calculating. But she really didn't get into shooting until she was with her first husband, Philip, where he took her on a major sporting event, a major hunting event in Botswana. And during this time, her husband was in the hunting mode. He was stalking. She became extremely dehydrated and started to slow him down where he left her under a tree with a stick and said, I'll come back for you. He continued to hunt these dangerous large animals to where the guide who was there was like, where is Karina? And when her husband was like, oh, I just left her, you know, under a tree, everyone panicked and they had to go out and rescue her because she could have been hurt by these very large animals. So she decided at that moment when she was under that tree in fear that she would never, ever again be in that position and she would learn how to shoot a gun. And this is where her love for hunting and guns came into play. Now, this love of guns and shooting and because of her job with Boss & Co., she found herself at the same hunting party as the King of Spain, King Juan Carlos I. So King Juan Carlos I is a very interesting man with a very checkered past. He was born on January 5th, 1938 in Rome, Italy. Now, when he was born, he was born into the Spanish royal family that was living in exile at the time. His grandfather, Alfonso XIII, was the last king of Spain before the abolition of the monarchy in 1931 and the subsequent declaration of the Second Spanish Republic. His family was living in exile during his childhood. Spain was ran by a dictator by the name of Francisco Franco, who won victory in a Spanish Civil War in 1939. Now, in 1947, Spain's status as a monarchy was affirmed, and a law was passed allowing Franco to choose his successor as he did not have any children. Now, Juan Carlos's father, Infante Juan, Count of Barcelona, was the third son of King Alfonso XIII and assumed his claims to the throne after Alfonso died in February of 1941. However, Franco was not too fond of Juan Carlos's father, and in 1969, he declared Juan Carlos to be his successor as head of state. Now, his father actually had to sign over his rights to the throne to his son, basically skipping a generation. Now his father desperately wanted to reinstate the monarchy, so much so that he wanted his son to kind of live with this dictator under his mentorship. So Juan Carlos grew up 
a military career under the watchful eye of Franco, and Franco became kind of a second father to Juan Carlos. Now, people had expected that when Juan Carlos would become king, that he would take over and continue the nationalist movement of the dictator. But instead, he completely switched it and brought democracy back to Spain. Now, he also brought in a constitution in 1978 and reestablished the monarchy as a constitutional monarchy and brought in the ability for the public to vote. So many people considered him a hero because he restored democracy back to Spain. However, several people did try to have a coup and overturn him, but he was successful in keeping Spain a democracy, and he became more of a royal figurehead as a constitutional monarchy and not a dictatorship. Now, Juan Carlos was married to Queen Sophia of Greece and Denmark in 1962, and they have three children. Infanta Elena, Duchess of Lugo, Infanta Cristina, and now King Felipe VI. By 1975, around the time that Juan Carlos became king after his coronation, rumors had started to swirl around that the marriage between Sofia and King Juan Carlos was not doing well. There's a rumor that Sofia walked in on Juan Carlos in bed with an Italian singer. So after that point, according to Juan Carlos, he and his wife had more of a marriage on paper, more for appearances where they would show up for state occasions, family occasions, but they started to live different lives. Now, Juan Carlos had a very bad reputation when it came to the ladies. Now, King Juan Carlos was known as the royal seducer. He was the Don Juan of the royal world, very charming. It is rumored that he betted over 5,000 women. Now, this sensational claim came from a member who worked with him on his security detail during the court hearings for his abdication in 2014. Now, the ex-police chief claimed that he had such a problem with his libido, it was considered a state problem, that they injected him with female hormones to control his rampant sex drive. That's right. They literally gave him testosterone blockers. Now, many people have claimed that they could possibly be the illegitimate child of King Juan Carlos I. I mean, if you bed 5,000 women, there's a pretty good chance someone may have gotten pregnant. Well, because he was king and had immunity, no one could ever really get to him, go to trial, get a DNA test. They were all pretty much shot down. There's a rumor that he even tried to seduce Princess Diana when she was 25 years of age. If you remember, her and Charles used to vacation with him and his wife on several occasions. Now, they said she thought he was very charming, but he was a little too pushy. So now we have the Don Juan royal seducer, King Juan Carlos, meeting this beautiful, tall, blonde Danish entrepreneur at an event on a cold February night in 2004. Now we enter the meet cute scenario. They meet at an event that is hosted by the Duke of Westminster, a huge hunting party at his lodge. Now, during this event, these events go well into the night, late, drinking, partying. But at this event, Corina sat in the corner away from the king and decided she was really tired and she wanted to retire for the night. It was well past midnight. They had to get up early. But the rule is you do not leave the table before the head of state. The same thing for Queen Elizabeth. If you're at a party, nobody leaves before the queen. Now, Karina was very tired. She wasn't feeling good. It was after midnight. She gets up from her table and strolls right up to King Juan Carlos and asks his permission to leave the party early. Now, Karina, never one to be a shrinking violet, 
not afraid of powerful men as even a king. She was married to a prince. She gets up from her table, walks over to the king, bends down and asks his permission if she can leave and go to sleep. Now, people were stunned because that is just not done. You don't go up to the queen or the king and say, hey, I'm sorry, but I need to retire. Didn't think twice about it. He grants her her wish. She goes to sleep. The next morning, she wakes up and she is told by her host that the king of Spain has requested her presence for her to be seated next to him because he needs help with his gun. Now at this time, she is working for Boss & Co., the gun maker. She's an expert at all types of guns. And of course, the king of Spain has a very expensive, elaborate set of guns and, and he needs assistance with one of his guns. So very quickly, they strike up a friendship and the king is besotted with this beautiful blonde. They're speaking English and they're speaking French while she's explaining to him how to fix his gun. So of course, at this point, she's a beautiful woman. She knows guns, two of the three things that he loves because King Juan Carlos loves women, money, and guns. So that day at the shoot, the king doesn't do very well, but she hits all her targets. And now he is very enamored with her, and they exchange phone numbers. Now, during this time, Karina knows he is very much married, and she has no interest in becoming his mistress and becoming another notch on his bedpost. She is also wrapping up her second divorce and she's running a business and a mother of two. So over the next seven months, the king starts calling and calling and calling. And they're very friendly, business-like phone calls, talking about guns. You know, his ambassador calls her, says the king would like you to help him with his guns. She sets him up, gets him all settled. Then the king calls her from his personal phone. They strike up a friendship, so much so that people started to recognize it was the king of Spain who was calling her, even though he had a code name when he would call, people knew it was King Juan Carlos. So after about seven months, they finally decide to meet. And when they meet, they're gonna meet for lunch. He sends a car. And this car takes her to the palace in Spain. But instead of the main palace, they take her to a little hunting lodge on the grounds of the palace. And when she walks in, she's a little taken aback because it doesn't look like a very grand estate. It looks like it hasn't been well taken care of since like the 1960s. And when they're there, they have a full staff of people waiting on them hand and foot. It is during this time that the king lets her know he is very interested in her. Now, there's a huge age gap, about 27 years between them, and she knows he's very married. And he will never divorce. It's just not going to happen. And he explains to her that they're married in name only. They've been living separate lives since 1975. And that she informs him that... She's not looking to be a notch on his bedpost. She's looking for love. Now, she's just getting out of her second marriage. She meets the king, and they hit it off immediately. This is when the fairy tale romance blossoms. Phone calls, trips, gifts, flowers. He wooed her and wooed her. He also hires her to do the honeymoon of his son, Prince Philippe and his new wife, Letizia. Now, this is a very elaborate, very expensive, and kind of private honeymoon that is not to be known by the public. The public sees one honeymoon where they're having a very scaled down event touring local towns in Spain. But in real life, the real honeymoon was very expensive and it was very luxurious. No cost was spared. That took them to Jordan, Cambodia, Fiji, Thailand, Samoa, America. Like it was very expensive, private island, private jets. No one in the public knew this lavish honeymoon they took behind the scenes. So after the very first date where they have this lunch at this little hunting lodge on the palace grounds, 
This then became their home away from home, even though they were jet setting to these hunts and romantic getaways and vacations and hotels and lavish dinners. The hunting lodge became their home away from home, their special place they refer to as the casita, where she would cook for him and the king would lavish in her cooking and they started building like a little private life where she started decorating the casita. And this is where he had a relationship with her son, where he started to act like a second father. So in her mind, he started to become the husband of her heart. She says she felt more married to him than she did to any of her ex two husbands. Karina falls in love with him quickly. They start to build a little family life, a pretend family with just him, the king and her son, Alexander. She wasn't a mistress. She was like a wife. And he was promising love to her, devotion to her, and again to her son. So at this time, his wife, who knew of his extramarital affairs, started to get wind that there was a new woman in town because she was there on a regular basis. And here is where trouble started brewing. So now you have the start of the fairy tale where the three of them are building a life together in their little casita. But as every fairy tale has a beginning and an end and slowly Karina starts to see red flags. Well I hope you enjoyed this first episode of Karina and the King. Be sure to stay tuned for episode two dropping next week. Thank you so much for stopping by my channel and please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Bye guys.